We gazed entranced at these exotics with their smooth faces and glowing youth, shining hair and perfect grooming, even to buff pink fingernails. Some of the younger children stood open mouthed. They actually did, you know. <laughs> Among us older ones, only Harold and Ben could really compare, maybe Clarice and one or two of the town girls. After the song, each one stepped forth to give a brief speech for the university. But this was undercut by their air of wonder that they were making their appeal to this isolated hamlet. What could ever come from here? But this attractive co-ed group stirred my own hunger for a different life, gave more proof of a social level I'd glimpsed often in our years of wandering, a level that meant quiet town neighborhoods of clipped lawns around neat houses of families with children off its college. I'd even had a couple of close-up glimpses. As a third grader in Depression-era Texas, I was often taken to the home of a wealthy couple at their invalid child's request so he could show off his expensive toys. Then later, after TM left defense work, TM began to seek out an economic sponsor in each new town. In Harrison, his boss was the son-in-law of a family prominent in local business. Dad once took me to their family compound to pick fruit for them. I clambered around in their cherry trees while the women of the family passed up empty pails and laughed at my antics. I was simply curious about their lives. Here in Baxter County, TM tried to link up with a local entrepreneur, a drawling nabob known as Mr. Jim, the one who speculated about paying back taxes on others' farms, kept a store, built a worker village for the dam, ran a float trip business on the rivers and the new lake. At some point, this pattern of dad's began to bother me. He would at times bring me some gift from his employer, a knife, a fishing lure, a fly rod lacking line guides or silk wrappings. Once a client he guided sent a new fly tying kit. Even as I gloated over these gifts, I knew I'd done nothing to deserve them. And I wondered what Dad had said to trigger this response. I felt it had to be demeaning. Even with Mr. Jim's sporadic fishing guide jobs, TM could not earn enough, he felt, and wasn't about to lapse into hill country subsistence living not after leaving the home farm for good in the 1920s. Following his efforts, exclusive of his own presence, to increase our self-sufficiency, he spent more and more time away in the Oldsmobile. This was scouting out work, he told us. Sometimes he was gone for a week or more. He did find temporary painting work in Marshall, a town about 40 miles off, and wrote to Vida to come for the weekend. She took the baby boy and left the others in my care, a task I'd had before, but never for that long. When Vida stepped off a return bus, she had only $7 and was clearly worried. This stirred my anxiety. A day or later, I got my, out my school paper to write Dad a letter asking for more help for Vida. That letter tickled his ego. He sent it on to his mother with a prideful covering note. Years after Grandmother Ivy's death, my cousin found it in my aunt's papers and sent it back to me. Rereading it after so many years caused me to laugh and to blush at my childish but deliberate use of flattery. I don't remember any real result. With construction over, only a small crew of powerhouse engineers and workers remained. Others moved away rapidly, including the family of a dark-eyed girl that I admired heading for California. Dub Eason, Dad's former boss on the dam, moved over to Cotter on the White River, where rumors were that an even larger corps of engineers' dam would be built. Of the half dozen dams projected to be built in the White's drainage, only protests would save its most beautiful tributary, the buffalo. At home, I had no progress with my animal training. The Jenny mules, led by fractious Judy, kept escaping from the corral to head north toward their old home. I hunted for them or for the cow almost daily. On one early spring afternoon, as I chased cowbell echoes in the valley beyond the ridge, I noticed the sky suddenly turned pale green. A dead calm fell. This seemed ominous. I glanced around, then ran to a clump of persimmon saplings, fell down, and wrapped my arms around the base of the largest one. Vida's father once told me he did this during a cyclone in Mississippi. Nothing happened, so after a while I got up, found the cow placidly grazing, and drove her home. Later, I heard that a tornado a mile away overturned a dump truck, killing the driver. Cut his head off. The mules ran off again. Tired and de desperate when I brought them in at dark, I left them tied together, then knotted a double rope around a central post. My mistake. In the night, Judy, the escape artist, worked the knot loose and nudged off the gate, fa gate fastening. I hunted them frantically, because my leaving them tied together meant they must be hung up dying of thirst. 
I searched only in the most likely direction, up the lake toward their old home. On the second day, Harold came with me. Together, we could scan more areas. We found them on the rocky trail past the abandoned Chapman place, a pioneer homestead. Apparently, running in the night, they'd struck a solid tree stub between them and broken the neck of Nudie, the gentler one. Judy was okay. Harold seemed appalled by my tearful cursing as I undid the rope from Nudie's neck. On his next trip home, TM took the survivor away and sold her. While he was back, we went to the river island to fish. This island, my favorite place, lay some distance below the dam, a boat-shaped stretch maybe a half mile long by an eighth wide, bordered by trees, brush, and river cane thickets. The most of it was one level field of tall Johnson grass cut regularly for hay. It was alone at the island's head, our first summer there, that I'd had my first real evidence of my bad eyesight, if I'd realized it. That time, I'd done no good at fishing, but as darkness fell, bullfrogs opened up. I decided to hunt some. I lit my carbide headlamp and picked up a short piece of iron reinforcement bar washed down from the dam. At once, I spotted a really large frog squatting in the shallows off the point. But to me, it looked strange, like it had a muffler knotted at its throat. I bopped it with a rebar, then saw that the muffler effect was the feet and legs of a very large toad splayed out from the frog's mouth. I pulled out the toad, which seemed unharmed, and hopped away fast. I shook my head, amazed, and waited on. In the center of a glass clear pool nearby, another large frog floated serenely with legs dangling. I shifted the iron bar to my other hand and bent to grab it. My lamp was dimly revealing all around me, including a large pink flower on the sand spit to my left. Before a thought could form, my left arm snapped the rebar sideways in a reflex that flung the cottonmouth moccasin, also coveting the frog, far into the darkness. That was enough of the island's allure and menace for one night. I backed out and went home. On this day, however, Dad and I expected no trouble as we crossed the island of the main channel, wading in and casting lures for bass. We did not know that the engineers had picked that day and time to test the new turbines they had installed to drive generators at the powerhouse. We had been in the water barely a minute when I glanced up and saw a fast-moving wave of foam and mist rushing at us. I yelled a warning, but before I could turn, it struck. At least we were sideways to the force. Even so, it threw me against Dad, who yanked me to him and jammed his left foot against my right tennis shoe. Just an inch backwards, he shouted above the roar, and that's what we did. The force tearing gravel from beneath us, the water leaping to my hip, though it was really only knee deep. Laughing and grimacing, we stamped and limped about to ease the bone aches before hiking back across the narrow channel. The penstock intake is 90 feet down. Intake is 90 feet down. Dad said, "That's why it's so damn cold." <laughs> TM drove off again, leaving me the man of the house, on call for Vida's needs and whims, which weren't so many. She seemed moodier now, though, staring at nothing as she smoked her hand-rolled bugler cigarettes and picked tobacco bits from her tongue. Harold had to be the man of his house, too, since he was the only child of a widowed mother. It had to be different, only the two of them. He never once hinted at any restraint or difficulty at home. Over the years of our family wanderings, Vida often acted as my buddy and confidant. Now she began to be more distant and irritable, maybe because Dad was away so much. Jack, Harold, and I planned to ramble on the city river one Saturday, but Vida said no. She decided to do the wash that day, and I must help, lugging water from the spring, filling the tubs and wash pots, starting the fire, gassing up the washer motor, and starting it, then staying around. Harold showed up first, eager as ever, running off the road from the dam and across the bare bedrock above the spring hole. I was down below, dipping my cup of woe and filling buckets. After a quick glance, I kept my head down and said he could forget me and go on with Jack. He asked why. I told him, and he let out a burst of laughter, then I did look up into his amused gaze. That's no reason, he shouted, jumping off the ledge and grabbing a bucket. In 20 minutes of furious action, we did it all and finished by starting the washer motor. Vida laughed at our panting efforts and said I could go. We ran across the road to get Jack and set off. It was already late in the school year, not quite strawberry time. The whole landscape shone clean from recent rains. The air breathed it, talking and laughing, no longer fearing truck traffic. We took up the middle of the road, heading down the valley to the river flat and the rail spur to the dam. We passed the empty worker shacks of Ellis with doors ajar and peeling tar paper. 
We left the road for a grassy track toward the burnt out commissary across the plain, but turned aside to drop into the bed of our meandering spring branches and headed for the river. Here we hunkered down to wash the sand from what Jack called two Indian bowls, chipped from bedrock to catch the flow from a side spring. We drank and wiped our mouth, then sprang up and crossed the trail to look at a large tablet grave by the rail embankment. There we stood ankle deep in new grass, studying the gracefully chiseled script. The dates were from nearly a century before, marking the brief life of a boy like us, only 17 when he died. The smooth sandstone was a bit larger than a single bed, laid on a curbing of slim oblong stones. The foot faced east, looking to the resurrection. The careful construction and beautiful lettering told that someone had cared deeply for the dead boy's life. Suddenly, Harold slipped down and stretched flat on the grave slab, hands beneath his head, smiling cheerfully. A shudder ran through me, maybe Jack too, as though Harold dared fate. But then in one graceful move, he was up the way he did everything. We dashed upon the rails and headed downstream, talking excitedly, waving arms for balance, seeing who could stay up the longest, and gave it up for stepping only on odd and even cross ties. No one glanced back at the streaky gray presence of the dam anchored between its ridges like a blank theater screen.